Well, what could be more challenging for a speaker, right? <laughs> a very tired group. So I realized my challenge. So we're going to pray, wake us up, and see if we can receive what God has in this session. Father, we thank you for this afternoon and all that you have poured into us. And uh, Lord, there's been such a balance of wisdom and uh, things that each of us can incorporate into our lives. So we thank you for each of the presenters today and thank you for just our host to be able to bring each of us together for this time. And uh, so Lord, we ask that you wake us up and to uh, give us another hour or so that we could uh, hear what you have to say to us, Lord. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Well, it's good to be with you and uh, good to be with Craig. Uh, Craig and I have known each other, I think, since around 2010. And uh, we've done a lot of conferences together. We did one actually here uh, earlier in the last year, uh, latter part of the year, with the, the Jubilee Conference. And, and uh, I met uh, Peter about 18 months ago. I heard that presentation and it so impressed me. Wasn't that powerful to see <clears throat> when you really do things that God calls you to do to serve people in extraordinary ways, what he can do with that. So what a great example and what Craig's uh, information on where we are and, you know, understanding the signs of the times. It's, uh, we're really in unique times. So I hope, uh, hope you'll be able to take this and really run with it. Uh, some of what I'm going to share today comes out of a book I wrote called Upside of Adversity as well as uh, Ch the Change Agent book and um, um, talking about something called the six stages and it's really a new book that I'm working on that uh, I, I discovered these six stages while I was working on this book Change Agent and what I realized was that uh, for every leader that God uses he often will take them through these six stages and so we're going to shift kind of what we've been talking about today back to you personally in helping you understand the processes that God uses in our lives to really bring us into the larger story of our life. Now, my presentation has a lot of information on it, and if you want to download it, you can do it by going to this website, slideshare.net forward slash Oz Hillman, a great website for presenters. <laughs> You'll see all the PowerPoints there, as well as the syllabus notes for everything I share. And it's free, and it's a free download. So that's uh, slideshare.net forward slash Oz Hillman. My story, I had an ad agency for 12 years back in the 80s, went through some uh, challenging times that started in 1994, and um, literally uh, took me to the bottom didn't go bankrupt, but went, you know, lost a lot of money, had family losses, had business losses, and that really ushered me into a seven-year season of adversity. And uh, it was during that season that God began to really do the deeper work in me. It led me to start writing uh, a devotional about that experience. And uh, how many of you get TGIF Today, God is First, the, the devotional? few of you do. If you don't, it's a free devotional, and we've got a printed version of it back there. But during that seven-year season, uh, I started writing this devotional about the adversity I'd gone through, and then God restored all the finances I'd lost seven years to the month. And um, in that season is when he birthed what I'm doing today. Ultimately, it's taking me to 26 countries, and I just finished my 17th book, <clears throat> And God literally turned a valley of acorn into a door of hope. You know, it says in um, Hosea, uh, acorn meaning trouble. And so often God uses our crisis events to usher us into that larger story. And that's really what we're going to cover. Uh, the devo there's uh, some uh, our resources. We've got two apps. One of them is this TGIF media app, and we've uh, got a... Uh, new radio show that uh, has just begun in September. In fact, Jim's company is sponsoring it here in the Atlanta, or the uh, Denver market, KLTT and KLVZ. 
I'll give you a little clip, uh, a 30 second clip of that. Coming up this week on Faith, Work, and Culture with Oz Hillman. Does your work matter to God? So many people in the workplace feel like second class citizens because they think their work life has no spiritual value. Do we view our work as a calling and opportunity to make God known? Listen for a biblical perspective on our work when you join us for Faith, Work, and Culture with Oz Hillman. So that goes, that, that uh, airs every Saturday, on, at, uh, it's 24 minutes long, and on those two stations, that's, uh, K, it's actually in my, at the bottom of my bio in your book, you'll see the, the call letters and the, where it is on the dial. So, are you living the larger story of your life? That's really the question we're going to try to answer, and I'm going to move this so I can actually see it. And how does God bring us into that larger story? That's what we're going to talk about in this session. The first stage that I discovered in this process is there's a recruitment for each of us to go into that larger story. And uh, many times that recruitment uh, requires a crisis event. The Apostle Paul, at the... Uh, at, when he was on the Damascus Road, Jesus appeared to him and said, you know, you are going to follow me. And he blinded him there on the Damascus Road. Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? I am Jesus, whom you persecute. Most of us have probably not had that level of encounter with God. And it's interesting in that, uh, that little scene there, Jesus says, you will suffer many things for my sake. And so often the level of the call often is commensurate with the level of adversity you will go through. And we will talk about that. I think of Martin Luther, who didn't grow up thinking, I'm going to be head of the Protestant Reformation one day. It happened because he was reading the scriptures and he could not make sense of the scriptures in light of the tradition that he was in, right? And it led to a crisis of the soul that he almost lost his life over. And then you think of Joseph who was thrown into the pit for those 13 years for preparation for an 81-year assignment after he got out at 30 years old. Or how about Esther who could have thought that having beauty was going to be the ticket to save an entire people. And that's exactly what happened, where she was a beauty queen. And God used that beauty to appeal to a king. And then how about David? One day David is showing up to bring food to the troops. And instead of just delivering food that day, he delivers a nation. And his life is forever changed by that crisis event. Or how about Martin Luther King, who as a 26-year-old one day, hears about a woman who refuses to give up her seat on the bus, and he is ushered in to a change that leads him into the larger story of his life. So the moral of these stories is that change agents are rarely looking to be change agents. They're often thrust into a situation that will take them into another 
larger story. Henry Blankaby said, you never find God asking persons to dream up what they want to do for him. When God starts to do something in the world, he takes the initiative to come and talk to somebody. For some divine reason, he has chosen to involve his people in accomplishing his purposes. Isn't that a beautiful statement and full of truth? The second stage God will take us through is the character development stage because God is more concerned about you becoming more like him than the assignment. But it often involves adversity and betrayal, a waiting period, and even perseverance. A few years ago, I was in Scotland, and we were doing my uh, change agent workshop, and in my workshop is one, one session called Overcoming Hindrances, and it deals with uh, how do we uh, rid all those things that might hinder us from fulfilling our larger story? And so we had just finished that session, and she came up to me and said, You know, Oz, uh, I just learned something in your session. I realized that I must be a free agent before I can be a change agent. And what she was saying was, I have to get out the stuff. And so God takes us through a process of character development designed to transform our minds and our spirits and our life. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I like what the message says and how it's expressed here. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you, and quickly respond to it, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. That's well said. You have a Joseph calling. That was the what uh, a mentor of mine said to me uh, two years into my adversity, and I couldn't make sense of my adversity. And he said, Oss, you have a Joseph calling. And a Joseph calling is one who actually goes through an extraordinary series of adversities in which their life is really defined by those adversity. And God uses those adversity to speak through your life and minister to people. And you are a spiritual and physical provider through that adversity. Not everybody has that type of calling, but there are some who do. And you probably know it if you do. <laughs> so, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, which means weeping, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. This is really a picture of the journey with God. As we walk with God, there's going to be these valleys in which God's going to take us there. And each one of those valleys is designed to deposit something and open a new spring of us in order to be able to refresh others in our Christian life. You see, Joseph had four big tests that he had to pass on his way to really becoming Joseph. The first one was betrayal. You know, would he, when he get, got out of uh, his situation, would he go back and pay back his brothers? But he chose to forgive them. The second thing is sexual uh, temptation. He did the only thing you could do in the situation where Potiphar's wife came after him. He fled. So he passed that test. And then there's perseverance. You know, he was there a long time, you know, first as a slave and then a prisoner. And uh, he was getting discouraged in prison because he gave a dream to the cupbearer one day and the cupbearer forgot him. And he told him, he said, now remember me for I've done nothing to deserve where I am today. And I think that got him two more years because he, you know, stayed there two more years. And, but God was doing a thorough work in this young man who would have such an influential part of a nation. And then stewardship. Would he handle the resources well when he got out of that situation? 
once he was entrusted with the resources of an entire nation? And we know the answer was yes. So personal crisis is often the first chapter of the larger story of our lives. You know, sometimes we can get discouraged when we have failures in our life. But I'm encouraged with this statement that only Jesus made plan A. God makes our B and C plan his A plan. God has an amazing uh, way of redeeming our lives. I can't imagine how God thought to turn my Valley of Acor into a guy who would write 17 books who barely got out of English class and uh, uh, was such an introvert and now is a speaker and uh, took me to 26 nations and I'd never been out of my own home state. Now, only God does things like that. The third stage is the isolation stage. And so often God isolates his leader. And the reason he does that is that he initiates a time of separation from past dependencies to realign their values. It's really a reset, if you will, and a place also where he will make deposits in their lives. Now, the thing about that, you know, when you think about someone like David, David ended up in a place called the Cave of Adullam. Now, David had had a remarkable prophetic thing over him from Samuel, and Samuel said, you're going to be the next king of Israel. And he went back to taking care of the sheep, and God brought him up to the uh, influencer with Saul, King Saul, because of his worship. And he brought him in proximity to King Saul, and he served him, and he served him so well that Saul became jealous, and of course he was fleeing Saul's sword who wanted to kill him because of that. And so now he has to fake madness to actually get through the town as he's fleeing Saul where Goliath grew up. And he fakes madness. Now, how bad does life have to get that you have to fake being crazy to get through a town? And that's exactly what happened. And he ends up in this place called the Cave of Adullam. He wrote three psalms in that cave. And so I can imagine that David is sitting there looking out over the, over the land and thinking, how did life get here? How did my life get here? Now, if things aren't bad enough, all of a sudden, a bunch of misfits, something like 400 misfits, join him in the cave. These are the down and outs of society. And which is worse, being there all alone by yourself or having a bus, bunch of dysfunctional people join you there? But the Bible tells us that he trained those men to be David's mighty men. He took a lemon and turned it into lemonade. They never lost a battle. And shortly after that time, God speaks to him and I, he says, Come out of the stronghold, go into the land of Judah. Of course, Judah means praise. We can't stay in that depressed state. We've got to enter into a new level of relationship. So God often turns our messes into messages and messengers. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who calls you by name, and the God of Israel. God is taking us into those places to reveal secret things. That's what he did with me in this devotional. The devotional now goes to 150,000 people a day in 104 nations. And the only explanation I have for that is that he reveals secret things in hidden places during a time of isolation and time of adversity. And there's one statement people come up to me every time who've been touched by the devotional, they say the exact same thing. You read my mail today exactly where I am. They always say that. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach in the housetop. So whenever God takes you in that isolation, he's depositing something in you in order to share it elsewhere. 
Jesus had a preparation for his own public ministry by being tested 40 days in the wilderness. And Satan came to test him about his identity, tried to tempt him on the physical and spiritual aspect of who he was. In Isaiah 49.2, we learn about his purpose statement and God's purpose for Isaiah. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me, and he made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And that was really what God had in mind for Isaiah. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, was in prison for preaching the gospel 12 years. He was in prison. And that's where he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. The Apostle Paul, excuse me, the Apostle John, wrote the book of Revelation during a time of isolation on the island of Patmos. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. How about Paul? Before Paul began his public ministry, we read these few sentences in the book of Acts that says that Paul spent three years in Arabia before he began his public ministry. We don't really understand or know much about that period of time, what happened during that time for him. Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison, comes out of prison and goes to the palace. What a contrast. Or Elijah, who went to the, uh, the brook to flee from Jezebel. He uncovers deep things out of darkness and brings the shadow of death to light, it says in Job 12. He reveals deep and secret things. He, he knows what is in darkness and light dwells with him, Daniel. So you can see a pattern here where God is showing us all the ways he... He uses these times of isolation in our life. And David wrote Psalm 34, 57, and 142. It's a very interesting read to hear the emotions that David goes through during that period of time in his life. So if God calls us into darkness in order to enter his presence, then that darkness will become an entry to new levels of relationship with a God who longs for fellowship with you and me. See, it's a real, it's a process that God's drawing us to himself to know him better. One of my clients, uh, when I had my ad agency, was Steinway Pianos. And I'll never forget the first time I went through the plant in Brooklyn, New York. It's a very old plant. It takes about a year to make one Steinway. And I was walking through each stage of making this piano. And my host said, now this is the soundboard room. And in this room, it has just one light, and it has all these soundboards, and those soundboards have been bent with great stresses on the wood, and they're just sitting there in darkness, being cured. I said, what a picture of the spiritual aspect of our lives sometimes. Then there's the waiting. There's often that waiting that God is in no hurry. Have you even noticed that God's really not in a hurry sometimes? <laughs> Abraham to, had to wait for Isaac. Moses waited 40 years before God spoke to him. Joseph waited 13 years until he was freed from captivity into his 81-year assignment. Elijah had to wait by the brook before God would show him the next step. Psalm 31, but as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Each of us has to trust God with the timing of what he's going to do. The fourth stage is the cross. The cross. Galatians 2.20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Character tests are designed to 
develop humility, trust, and intimacy with God and ultimately bring us to the end of ourselves. I've learned over the years that both God and Satan want you dead, but each for different reasons. See, God wants your old man to die. He wants your flesh to die. It says in 2 Corinthians, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. But we also know that Satan wants to destroy your life. He tries to kill you at birth if he can. Uh, he tries to kill babies every day through abortion, which is over 60 million he's done. He tried to kill Jesus at birth. He tried to kill Moses at birth. If he can't kill you at birth, he'll try to wound you so badly in your growing up years that you'll be so dysfunctional you won't be any good to anyone. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy from your life, John 10, 10. So we're in a spiritual warfare every day of our life. Can a dead man have stress, though? <laughs> Have you ever seen a dead man have stress? I don't think so. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead in, indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our, our Lord. So we are to live dead to sin, but alive unto God, so that Christ is living completely through our vessel. A few months ago, I was in Hawaii, and we were having a, a dinner meeting with the leadership team before the, the meeting that was going to be the following day, and a woman asked me a question. She was asking about my ministry, and she'd heard my story, and she said, now, was there ever one thing that happened to you during your journey of those adversity periods that really changed everything? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, I died. <laughs> she said, what? I said, yeah, I, d I died. I realized that I wasn't dead. When I became dead, God began to move. And he began to orchestrate things. And I said, all you have to do is die. When you die, I'll, I'll, I'll send you flowers. Well, she chuckled. And Next day, we have our event. And it just so happened that the two ladies that were, I was having this conversation with show up at the event in black and it just so happens that at the end of the event they were all given flowers I said well it looks like I didn't have to send you flowers after all you got them sent to you by God <laughs> so often when God is dealing with us we're willing to come to the cross ourselves and we we want all of God but unfortunately we can only put two nails in that cross and so what God does is he raises up a third person to put that, that nail in for us, and usually it's through a betrayal. For Jesus, it was Judas. For David, it was Absalom. For, for Joseph, it was his brothers. You see, I think that as leaders, God's trying to see if we're willing to really walk the same path Jesus walked. Are we willing to wash the feet of our Judases? David talks about his own situation in which someone betrayed him. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man equal, my companion and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. Betrayal is very difficult. Because it empties ourselves. It says, are, am I willing to wash the feet of Jesus? Am I willing to bless those who curse me? And many times that, this, that is the hardest test that we'll go through. The Apostle Paul went through a lot of adversity. But one of the things you never hear Paul do in his writings is he never has self-pity. He never says, oh God, why are you doing this to me? He never impugns the nature of God, which many of us, we, when things go bad, we say, God, why are you doing that you know, to me? Listen to how he processes his own adversity. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. 
We're struck down but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body for life in you. I die for you to live. I die to create life in you. That's really what Peter was talking about, wasn't it? He was giving his company up to the Lord. He was saying, I'm going to die, and I'm going to let my life be a poured-out offering. I'm going to let my company be a poured-out offering on my employees to see what God will do to create life. He created 76 new lives so far. You see, God has to disqualify you from thinking you were qualified for the mission he has for you. That's what he did with Moses. You know, Moses tried to solve the problem in the flesh by, by killing that Egyptian. And so God set him aside and let him think about it for 40 years. Moses spent his first 40 years thinking he was somebody He spent his next 40 years learning he was nobody. And he spent his third 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. (laughs) Well said, D.L. Moody. Sometimes a man finds his destiny on the road he most seeks to avoid. Gene Gullion said, God gives us the cross and the cross gives us God. Crisis and pain leads to greater commitment obedience and intimacy with him if we press into him. If we don't press into him, and we, we can become the victim to our circumstance, and that leads to bitterness. But it loosens our grip on the cares of this world. I like this verse out of Micah, and I think it's a prophetic verse for the days that we're entering because I think we're going to see many, many Josephs birthed in this next season if what... Uh, Craig is talking about truly comes true. We're going to see a lot of pain. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame. I will gather the outcast and those whom I've afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. I have a friend who used to say, Beware of any Christian leader who does not walk with a limp. (laughs) Many of us business leaders are just like Esau. We strive, we manipulate, we control, but we've got to have that ultimate wrestling with God to remove the hip in order that we have complete dependence on him. You see, pain is designed to encourage obedience that leads to intimacy with God. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. Hebrews talks about even what Jesus had to go through. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. If Jesus had to suffer, what does that mean about me? (laughs) Now, the higher you go up on the mountain of influence, the greater the scrutiny is going to be. You see, when Moses was leaving to start his assignment after that burning bush experience, he made a faulty error. And that was he failed to circumcise his son. And God was not pleased with that because it was a sign of the covenant between God and his people and he was very picky with his leader and he almost died it was only because of his wife who saved his life the fifth stage is problem solving change agents are often problem solvers through invention and entrepreneurship when Jesus prayed this prayer Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Was that an allegorical prayer? Or did he mean that? What does it mean to bring heaven into a business? We've heard some examples today. 
What does it mean to bring heaven into whatever sphere you operate? 1 John 3, 7 through 9, it says that not only did Jesus come to be the Savior to bring us salvation, he also came to destroy the works of darkness. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And that is an assignment for you and me as well. And we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. And that means that you and I are all killer sheep. We are not mamby-pamby sheep. We are killer sheep designed to destroy the works of darkness. And that's what, that's what Peter modeled for us today is that he's modeling how do I destroy the works of darkness in my employees through love, through serving them, through passionate serving them. So Jesus modeled this by solving problems everywhere he went. He solved Peter's fishing problem. He solved his tax problem. He solved the woman at the well's problem. He solved the prostitute's problem. He solved the woman uh, with the issue of blood problem. He solved the blind man's problem. Every time he solved the problem, he gained influence. And that's the number one thing that the body of Christ could do to shift this culture. If we went from being critics of culture to being problem solvers of culture, you'll see greater influence. So the culture doesn't care who solves their problem. They just want someone to solve their problem. They don't care if it's a Christian. If you start solving a problem, you'll start having influence. That's exactly what happened with Jesus. So can we be trusted with a problem to bring a God solution to it? That's what he wants to know. Billy Graham made this statement a few years ago as he's, you know, gotten older. He was asked to comment about the difference between his time of evangelism and where we are in this society. Back when we did the big crusades in football stadiums and arena, arenas, the Holy Spirit was really moving and people were coming to Christ as we preached the Word of God. But today I sense something different happening. I see evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in a new way. He's moving through people where they work and through one-on-one -on -one relationships to accomplish great things. They are demonstrating God's love to those around them and not just with words, but in deed. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's, you know, that is what God has created us to do. It's an outcropping of that relationship. So God is waiting for his change agents to step into their destiny. Romans 8, 19, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. See, God is waiting for us to step into the game. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Each of us has that in us. He saw problems. Cool. Perhaps if you brought the nets in when I said. Please shut up. How's your catch? Poor. Cast your nets on the right hand side. Left or right, it won't make any difference. Cast them on the right hand side. <laughs> Great scene there, isn't it? The first thing encounter Jesus does, he solves a problem. He solves his fishing problem, his tax problem. He solved the feeding of the 5,000 problem, the blind man's problem, the prostitute's problem. When John the Baptist was arrested and he was about to be beheaded, there's a 
really interesting dialogue he has with one of the disciples. And he's, he's probably at a low point. He knew who Jesus was, but even the devil came and questioned through him, was he really the Messiah? Because if he's really the Messiah, why would I be here about to have my head cut off? Why wouldn't he come and rescue me? And so he asked a disciple, go back or go and ask him, are you really the Messiah? And Jesus sent back word and said, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. What did he answer him with? The fruit. Just look at my fruit. David, as I mentioned earlier, he, he came to a situation in which he saw the Israelites cowering before Goliath. And David does something interesting. Even as a young teenager, he asks a question. He says, what will be done for the man who kills Goliath? So David was obviously a good Jewish boy who, who knew business too. So he's asking a pre-qualifying question about risk and reward. What's going to be done for the man who does this? Well, he's not going to have any taxes. He's going to have great wealth. And he's going to get a wife, the king's daughter. He said, slam dunk, I'm in. And so the other thing you see about this encounter is that David had an understanding of covenant. And he talked to that Philistine and said, who are you uncircumcised Philistine that you stand before the God of heaven? And he took authority in that situation. And we all know the rest of the story. So, Joseph, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Because he's a problem solver. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there's no one so discerning and wise as you, you shall be in charge. You want to grow in a, a company? You want to advance in an area? Start solving problems. You will be valued. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over the land of Egypt. Each leader was an answer to something God had in mind he wanted to do on earth. Tomorrow we're going to talk about how God delegates authority to you and I in order to fulfill his purpose in the earth through human beings. Johann Gutenberg was a great example of this, and he was an inventor, of course, of the Gutenberg Press. Sixty years later, the Protestant Reformation shows up. How strategic of God. Let us give wings to truth in order that she may win every God that comes into the world by her word, no longer written at the vast expense, but multiplied everlastingly by a machine which never wearies. See, he understood the prophetic significance of his invention and how it was going to impact the world. Some didn't understand it. They said, what's the big deal about this, this thing you've created? We don't understand he goes on and says, It is a press, certainly, but through it, God will spread his word. A spring of pure truth shall flow from it like a new star. It shall scatter the darkness of ignorance and cause a light hitherto unknown to shine among men. He was not only a businessman, he was a prophet. Finally, this last stage is networks. Change happens by a small number of change agents banding together. William Wilberforce was a man who thought at 28 years old after coming to Christ, being led to Christ by John Newton, who wrote the, the uh, hymn Amazing Grace. And he was already being groomed in politics. And he was going to go into, quote, the ministry and leave politics. And Newton said, no, you are not. You are called into government. And that is where God will use you. And God did use him to abolish slavery after 30 years of work, 69 world-changing initiatives through 14 to 18 individuals called the Clapham Group. And they leveraged what they did together. 
You see, God really believes in team, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus and the disciples, Daniel and his three friends. James Hunter wrote a book called To Change the World. He says the key actor in history is not individual genius, but rather the network and the new institutions that are created out of these networks. And the more dense the network, that is the more active and interactive the network, the more influential it could be. In Genesis, it says, the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, but they have all one language, and this is what they'll begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Now, we always see that in the context of using their unity in the wrong way, but the truth is nothing is withheld from them when they are unified. I do pray for, uh, for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, and me and I and you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. For, for years, back 20 years ago, when I first read that verse, I saw a dynamic of that verse that very few people talk about. And Jesus is saying that if you'll do this over there, here, I will do this over here. In fact, if you unify over here, something's going to happen to those people out there. They're going to start believing because you did this. The fish are going to start jumping in the boat. Evangelism is going to be real easy. But we miss that, and we don't unify. Let's look at David's six stages as we wrap up this afternoon. He was recruited, anointed by Samuel. He then goes through his character phase with fleeing Saul's sword. Then he's thrown into the cave for his isolation period. The cross through his betrayal by Saul and Absalom. Then he becomes a problem solver for Israel. And his network is his David's mighty men. You see, there's always a trumpet call opportunity. Moses at the burning bush. Gideon called to destroy idols. Esther called to save a nation by going before the king. Peter called to lead the church. William Wilberforce. Let's look at Daniel's six stages. He was, his recruitment was taken to Babylon. He had to serve a godly king. He was isolated in Babylon. He had to come to the risk of his own death by either interpreting a dream or dying. He revealed the dream by solving that problem. He was elevated. He had his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the question for each of us is, is there a poster in hell with our name on it? Are we a threat to the kingdom of darkness? In Acts, it says, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know, but who are you? When you get up in the morning, do the devil shake? Oh my, he's up, she's up. Get ready. Danger, danger. <laughs> I pray that be so. Let's pray. Father, it's been a long day today, but it's been a good day. And uh, you've made deposits in our life today. And so now we just ask you to just soak us with what you want us to receive from this day. And Father, I just think of those who are come today and they carry a burden. Father, I want to lift those people up to you. Maybe they're in their Joseph season. We thank you, Father, for them being here. We would ask, Lord, that you would touch them in a special way even before they go to bed tonight, that these words would encourage them that you, that they are not to give up, but they are to see you in a different light of what you may be doing in their life and taking them through a process that maybe they didn't quite understand. Father, we're grateful that you tell us that you'll never leave us nor forsake us but you never said it wouldn't feel like that sometimes. <laughs> so we honestly 
come to you, Father, with our doubts and even our frailties. And we give it to you, Lord, today, afresh. And we give you permission to do anything in our life if it means fulfilling every purpose and destiny for us. So we make that prayer to you today, Father. And ask, Lord, that you begin afresh as we start this new year on doing new things in our life, new priorities, and new adventures. Thank you, Father. I pray for each one as they leave today that you'll minister to them in their dreams. They'll be able to meditate on the things you've deposited in them today. We'll give you the glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless.